Welcome to the Pacey Performance Podcast. Today, I'm speaking with sprint and agility expert, Rennell Hobson. Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to episode 43 of the Pacey Performance Podcast. So today we've got a really cool guest on the line in Rennell Hobson. So over the last couple of months, me and Rennell have been speaking about a few different things. Um, so we asked her to get on the podcast because I knew it would be a, a great episode. Um, and I knew that she was coming over to the UK uh, on the 2nd and the 4th of October. So I thought it would be great to kind of uh, put the word out that she'll be coming over because she'll be um, it'll be a great couple of days. If you do want to check out um, Rennell's website, it's academyofspeed.com. And if I think if you go to events, you can look at all the things she's got going on in the uh, in Australia, and then over in the UK uh, in Manchester at the start of October. So just want to say, if you do want to check out all previous episodes of the podcast, you can get over to pastyperformance.co.uk. And if you want to check out the links, I'll put the link to Ronell's work, couple of workshops that she's doing in the UK uh, on the website. So it's pacyperformance.co.uk forward slash 43. So I put uh, a little message out on Twitter to ask who everyone wanted to get on the, me to get on the podcast in the next couple of months. Uh, I had a really great uh, response to that. So we've got some awesome guests coming up. Um, from all over the world, uh, and, and we've uh, I've kind of put into put into practice the um, the contact that people have put forward on Twitter, which is great, and I really appreciate that. If you are enjoying listening to the podcast, please give an honest rating and review on iTunes. Um, that'd be really appreciated. But here is the interview with with Renell Hobson. Okay, hi guys, welcome to the Pacey Performance Podcast. So today we have Renell Hobson, who is the train director at the Academy of Sports Speed and Agility in Australia. So welcome to the podcast, Renell. Thank you so much. No worries. So just before we get going uh, into the into the meat of the, the, the chat, do you want to give us a little bit of a, a background, uh, your education and what you're currently doing? Absolutely. Well, I've been involved in sports all of my life. Um, I was one of those athletes that was fortunate enough to grow up in an era where we actually did a winter and a summer sport. Um, now with the specialisation in youth, do you know what I mean, in terms of sports, a lot of those kids don't get that. Don't get that. So um, I did uh, state netball all through the winter and then I did track sprinting in the summer. And I think that having those two skills really helped me, um, you know, in what it is that I do now in the academy. Uh, in terms of education, I've got a degree in sports science and coaching. Um, I'm a certified strength and conditioning specialist with the NSCA. Uh, level three advanced event um, coach for the Australian Track and Field Coaches Association in Sprints Hurdles Relays. Uh, I've got a grad dip in adult education because I work um, at the Western Sydney Institute as the department head of sport and fitness education. And I'm currently completing my master's in applied science in sports coaching. Nice. How's the, ma how's the master's going? Master's is going really well. Um, I'm actually really excited about it. I'm about to start my directed study in the difference between field-based sprinting um, and track sprinting. So I really want to get into the, the grits of that and be able to give uh, coaches a lot of applied understanding of the difference between field-based uh, speed um, and how different that is to track sprinting. Cool. So you just want to yeah. give us a little bit more info on the, on the academy itself? Absolutely. So the Academy of Sports Speed Agility, we actually only started this um, academy five years ago. Um, as I said, I've been in coach education and uh, for a long time and uh, Kip, my husband and I used to go and watch a lot of sport on the weekend. And one of the things that I found quite frustrating was that a lot of the athletes uh, didn't know how to run correctly. And I could see all of these force leakages and energy leakages all over the paddock. And I thought there really needs to be something done about that um, at a youth level. And so because of my passion in speed and sports speed, we decided to start the academy. 
Um, and we now have over 100 athletes that we work with uh, each week, just really, really focusing on getting some really good foundations in running mechanics and speed mechanics into those athletes. And then I do work with, um, with uh, you know, teams of, of all different levels um, and across a wide range of sports as well. I mean, we've worked in netball, baseball, football, uh, in rugby league and rugby union um, and baseball as well. So, oh, and I've also got quite a few tennis players at the moment that I'm working with. Um, so, you know, getting those foundations into them when they're young, I think that's something that then they'll be able to carry through to the rest of their career. Cool. So do they do, um, do, do they tag you on to their kind of technical session or is it a, a pure standalone kind of athletic development session? It depends on the club. Um, I've just done uh, quite a few sessions at uh, what we call Netball Central here in New South Wales um, with an academy there and they do standalone sessions. So it just depends. Sometimes I might go in uh, where the teams are doing a circuit format and I might have a series of players that come to me for 30 minutes, do I mean, and then go around to maybe ball skills or something like that. And then other clubs will have me and just uh, let me just run the program completely. Mm -hmm. So yeah. just, before, just before I forget, you're coming over to the UK a bit I later, certainly am. A bit later yeah. in the year. Do you just want to tell us what you, what kind of thing you're doing over in the UK? Um, just so everyone kind of is aware where you're going to be. Absolutely. So um, over in the UK, we're heading over there uh, at the beginning of October. So I'm going to, I have a Sports Speed for Coaches course that I run all through here um, in Australia, teaching coaches everything that we do in terms of the fundamentals of getting speed mechanics right, hip getting rid of hip mobility restrictions, everything that a coach needs to make their players lightning fast. Um, and I'll be delivering that at Manchester Metropolitan University. Um, and that's on Friday the 2nd of October and then Sunday the 4th of October. So I'm really looking forward to that. Um, we're also um, going to be visiting uh, a few youth academies um, in field and court-based court sports while we're in the UK and just really talking to coaches, creating a lot of uh, great discourse in, you know, explosive speed for field-based sports. So, so far we're booked into four EPL and championship youth academies, um, but we'd love to, to talk to anyone that wants to come and talk to us or, you know, that would invite us to come and see them while we're there. Cool. Sounds good. I'm sure you get some, uh, I'm sure you'll get more, in hopefully get more interest. So let's get into the um, let's get into the meat and potatoes of it. So just want to get your um, opinion on and, and how you how you progress, uh, like you say, the um, the mechanics of, of sprinting. First of all, first of all, the kind of acceleration side of things. Do you just want to talk to us about how you're teaching coaches and how you're actually teaching athletes um, yeah, about absolutely. acceleration mechanics? Yeah, absolutely. So there's a couple of things that we always talk about um, in terms of um, acceleratory mechanics, and that is that to be really great at acceleration, you need excellent technique. Uh, so we look at foot strike, we look at foot mechanics, and we look at um, you know stride turnover. Your athletes need to be strong. So we look at the strength of the athletes and we show coaches how to develop strength on the field rather than going into the gym for um, youth-based athletes. Um, and then we talk to um, coaches and athletes as well about body composition. So we don't want them carrying a lot of useless mass around the field. So the way that we start is we start with uh, what we call the wall drill. Um, and this is really just to teach posture and position uh, for athletes. So this is where the athlete leans against a wall at a 45 to 55 degree angle. Um, you know, they have their straight arms um, onto the wall. And we really look at making sure that the head to the heel position is really strong and straight. So uh, we make sure that the athlete's up in toe off position. So we, we talk about foot strike and in foot strike, we then talk about toe off when the athlete's accelerating through and driving onto the ball of their foot. Um, and what we do is we then get the athlete to pull the heel up underneath the buttocks and keep it under the hips. And we just look at the real strength and the stability that the athlete has to hold that posture uh, while they're um, powerfully swapping the legs over in that position. So that's where we start. We always talk about athletic posture with our athletes, making sure that they're really nice and strong and stable from head to heel. So once we've done that and they're, they're um, nice and strong and straight with their posture, then what we do is that we get them to do um, a drill that we call a wall drill. Um, 
and the wall slide drill is for foot recovery. So one of the things that we find um, is that when we're watching athletes play on the field, their foot's spending too much time behind the body in what we call like a negative running position before it's pulled through to the front of the body. And the wall slide drill that we uh, teach athletes to do fixes that. So what we basically do is that we get athletes to uh, practice pulling their foot up in a dorsiflex position. So, you know, toe back towards the shin up against a wall. So we get their glutes on the wall, their calves on the wall, their heels on the wall, and then we get them to just pull their heel up explosively up and under the hip. And one of the big things that we find is that athletes usually only get part way up, so they might get just above the knee, and then what happens is that the foot pulls away from the wall. Um, and what that's, that's telling us is that they're using too much anterior movement rather than posterior movement. In a game such as football, for example, we want to make sure that they're using the posterior chain to move them around the paddock and reposition and get ready for the next play rather than using the anterior chain, which we really want to reserve for kicking force um, and things like that. So we make sure that we correct that as, as much as we can. Um, I mean, the whole goal of both of these drills is to, to get the right posture, get the right hip and the knee angle uh, and ankle position um, without any collapse. So we, we look at eccentric strength in the athlete, you know, in, able to, in terms of, you know, when they step up and over and they actually uh, power down into the ground, is there any collapse through the posture of the athlete? And then, as I said, the third thing is that triple extension strength. So it's crucial for young athletes to be really strong. Um, and, you know, we really focus on glute strength, you know, for maximum acceleration and, and great force into the ground. Um, and the way that we do this on the field is that we attach the athletes uh, via the waist to like a skills 360 recoil or a bungee uh, type of piece of equipment and we get them really low to the ground with their chin tucked in and they're um, sitting down, you know, with their or they're hunched down over their, over their feet and we get them to drive out explosively really low to the ground in a triple extension of the hip, knee and ankle. And then they just regather the foot and then they drive out explosively again. And having the resistance attached to that action means that we're getting good strength development in the perfect action that we need for acceleration on the field. Um, and we get our athletes doing this, even you know young 12 year old athletes, we get them doing this under resistance for up to 30 meters. Um, and it's a killer when they first start, um, but you see the strength straight away starting to develop in the athletes and it's exactly what they need. So those three things, powerful and explosive acceleration, we need great technique, we need very good posture and stability um, and then we need a good amount of strength in that triple extension drive. Very good. So how does that, how does that differ from top end mechanics and how you may teach that to the kids and to the coaches themselves? Top end mechanics is really, really interesting because, um, as you're aware, a lot of coaches, um, you know, in the past didn't think that there was a need for top end mechanics in field based sports because, you know, they didn't think that athletes got an opportunity to reach top end um, speed very often. So they didn't train it. But I think coaches are really becoming aware now at the importance of you know, top end speed and also in the, in the importance of speed reserve. So um, we train this on a regular basis with our athletes. Uh, we know that if we increase their top speed, then that's going to increase their acceleratory speed because their acceleratory speed is a percentage of their top speed. So as you improve that top speed, then the speed of their acceleration improves as well. So the way that we train this, again, we work on technique. Everything's about being technically proficient and excellent um, in technique. And then we start, um, you know, working on strength. So for top end speed, what we do is the wall slide drill that I mentioned earlier, um, it teaches a quick recovery of the foot off the ground, which is what we need for um, top end speed as well to make sure that the foot's not in that negative position, as I mentioned before. Um, but what it also does, it, it is also teaches the athlete to, to pull the foot up and have a short swing thigh. So a lot of the times when we're assessing uh, field-based athletes, we see that they're pulling a long lever through when they're running through. And as you know, when we're pulling a long lever through consistently, then that's churning up a lot of energy that we really wouldn't want to um, churn up. You know, a lot of our games are lost in the last 10, 15 minutes because, um, you know, of a lack of uh, fuel um, that's left in the tank for the athletes. So we want to make sure that we're pulling through a short lever. And that's what the wall slide drill teaches. So... As I said before, they're pulling the, the foot up explosively under the hip and we work on hip mobility restrictions if there's any there to make sure that the hip's nice and mobile so the foot can come all the way up to the buttocks 
before it then pulls through and then steps down onto the track. So we really start thinking about levers and how the lever of the leg's being used. Um, so a short lever is easier to pull through um, and it's much faster than a long lever. So what we do is we teach the athlete to pull the foot, the, the heel up towards the buttocks, punch the knee forward so that the thigh is slightly parallel to the ground or the knee is just above parallel and then we get them to hammer down onto the ground. So we're linking gait mechanics and then uh, running ground reaction forces, really getting a good strength um, onto the ground. So hammering that foot down onto the ground is really, really crucial. And then again, the quick pickup of the foot. So we're really looking at those um, stride mechanics in the athlete and making sure that they're perfect. And then with that strength accompaniment, then we get some more explosive speed occurring. Cool. Sounds good. Yeah. So so how does that how does that then relate to obviously you mentioned you mentioned field based sports. How does that then relate to change of direction ability and how you may how you may teach that? Yeah, change of direction is, is a, a completely different again. Change of direction, we're really, really looking at eccentric strength in the athletes. So we're making sure that they uh, that they don't collapse as they lower their centre of mass down towards the ground. I think most coaches now know that in terms of change of direction, um, you know, we want to make sure that the athlete lowers their centre of mass to the ground and puts their toe in the direction in which they want to go. Um, so again, we work on technique first. We get the athletes to feel the difference between the weight of the body being on the inside edge of the foot for when they're actually going to drive laterally um, in a cutting step, for example. Um, and we do this again under resistance. So simple shuffling drills where you're teaching the athletes to know the difference between having their, their weight on the inside edge of the foot or the outside edge of the foot and how that changes the direction in which the, the athlete will move. Um, so with change of direction, the athlete needs to be really low, as I said, and we want the outside leg to push um, through the inside edge of the foot um, and then uh, drive the body. So we want to make sure that the that the shin's in a positive shin angle so that the skeletal structure is actually driving the athlete um, into the correct direction, which is laterally, for example, in a cutting step. Um, so, And then what we want is we want to maximise triple extension strength again in that first push or step. So the inside leg, um, you know, so we talked about the outside leg and the outside leg making sure that the force is coming through the inside edge of the foot, that the um, shin is in a positive angle going towards the direction that the athlete needs to be. And then if we think about the inside foot, the inside foot, we want that also to be in a positive shin angle, but inside the actual shoulder width of the athlete so that the shoulder is directing the actual direction in which the athlete's going to be travelling. Yeah. So how... The, go on, sorry, go on. No, that's, I was just going that's to talk good. about how the outside leg then. So the outside leg then, we need that to pull through quickly across the body um, and we want to make sure that the shoulders and arms are also working to counteract the actual rotational um, aspect of the hip. So there's quite a few technical issues that occur in terms of change of direction, but I think the most important thing is getting the athlete to feel the difference, as I said, between inside edge and outside edge foot because then we'll progress them obviously to a crossover step uh, which is the most common step that you'll see in field-based um, sports. I think for coaches, though, the um, change of direction and the, and the agility progressions are the things that are really key. So once you've actually got the technique going with the athletes, it's then about making sure that they understand that we do change of direction patterns, which are specific to the sport, so there's always going to be some analysis of sport movements that occur and that will be different for different sports. And then we add the change of direction patterns with the sports skill. So we add a sports skill either to the beginning or to the end of the actual change of direction movement pattern. And then we add in responses. So, I mean, most coaches understand that change of direction and agility are terms have changed over the past few years and agility is now a change of direction in response to a stimulus. So we always make sure that we're doing a, both an auditory and or a visual or sometimes both stimulus for the athletes depending on the sport that they play and we'll add that stimulus into the change of direction training and then once again add some sort of sports skill to the beginning or to the end of that pattern movement yeah and then we just mix it up as much as possible make sure that the nervous system's being challenged um, and the more the nervous system's challenged then the greater the response that you'll get and the greater the adaptation that you'll get for the athlete cool you answered my question there so i don't know why i put it in because i <laughs> So you talked a little bit previously about um, hip mobility 
and the importance of hip mobility. Do you just want to um, give us a bit more detail in um, why that's so important and how you may um, go about identifying that and then fixing that? Yeah, absolutely. Hip mobility is crucial, absolutely crucial for um, the achievement of lightning speed, I think, and um, all, all around maximum athletic performance. Um, it's one of the biggest uh, issues, I think, that we see in, not only in youth development, but also in, you know, athletes at, the, at an elite level. And there's a lot of things that the coaches can do to identify whether or not there's hip mobility restrictions. Uh, we always do this in, in the warm-up. So, for example, in a warm-up, we might add in drills like Cossacks, which is a lateral explosive movement of the leg from side to side. We'll put in an inchworm um, where, you know, or where the athletes are in a starting in a plank position but walking the feet with straight legs um, and, again, in a dorsiflexed position. Uh, towards the hands as much as possible and then walking out again and doing that repeatedly. Uh, we do things like Russian walks where the athlete's standing up but pulling the knee all the way above parallel and then extending the foot out and seeing if the athlete can do that without the foot coming back down towards the ground as the knee's extending. So there's a lot of drills that we put in um, which allow us to assess in the warm-up what athletes are, are struggling with hip mobility um, or, you know, getting hip restrictions both laterally and forward and back. And um, and I think that that's key. One of the things that I see is that sometimes in warm-ups, coaches are standing around and, that, you know, if the athletes kind of know the pattern or the routine of the warm-up that they need to go through, there's not a lot of input from the coaches that are sort of standing on the sideline. But I think that this is an area where we can really educate our athletes um, and make sure that the athletes are aware of where restrictions are occurring and how that's going to negatively impact their performance on the field. So if we look at some of the things, I mean, tight hip flexors, for example, is a classic um, in so many of the young athletes that we work with each week. And if you look at tight hip flexors, they, you know, if the hip flex is really, really tight, then it, it impedes the capacity for the glutes to go through a full contraction. And the glutes are crucial in terms of explosive speed. So if the glutes are being negated from going through a full contraction and the glutes are responsible for acceleration, for deceleration, for you know, jumping off one foot, off two feet, um, then all of these things are impeded in, in terms of the overall performance of the athlete just because of the tight hip flexors. If we then look at the glutes and if the glutes are really tight, then uh, with the glutes being tight, the athlete's not going to be able to pull the swing thigh through to the height that they need to be able to create maximum force onto the ground and explosively drive the, 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 the athlete forward if we think of, you know, forward or horizontal propulsion. So just having, you know, tight tight hip flexors, tight glutes, you know, the ITB, the ITB is a huge one. You know, we foam rollers have become such a fad in sport, do you know what I mean? But, but one of the things that they do is that they start to slowly remove adhesions that are being created in the ITB. And one of the things that uh, the glute medius, the TFL and the ITB are responsible for, the ITB if it's really, really nice and supple, can act as a, a slingshot to whip the knee back down underneath the hip um, as the, you know, in terms of that elastic strength, pulling the foot back down onto the ground. So if that's impeded because of adhesions within that area or tightness through the glute medius or the TFL, then again, we're looking at all of these things that restrict our athletes from being explosively, um, you know, and and nice and fast on the on the field. So hips are crucial. It's one of the biggest things that we, that we really look at in both warm-ups and in uh, recovery strategies for the athletes to make sure that, that they're ready to go. Would you ever put on kind of specific hip mobility sessions so you mentioned that you you do things in the warm-up that may um may increase that that hip mobility but would you put on specific sessions like 15 minutes prior to prior to sprint training um i mean in a perfect world that would be a fabulous okay. thing to be able to do but yeah. i think that as coaches we're so restricted to the time that we have with our athletes um so one of the things that we do is that we really educate the athletes about the importance of hip mobility. We talk to them not only about hip mobility in terms of performance, but also in uh, decreasing risk of injuries. I mean, most coaches now are familiar with Mike Boyle's joint by joint approach to training and the fact that if the hip becomes really restricted, then the athlete will normally get either lower back pain or knee pain. And we sort of see a lot of our young athletes suffering from these sorts of conditions. So what we do is that when we identify hip mobility, um, 
issues in the warm up or the cool down, then we give the athletes take home programs to do that are specifically designed to increase range of motion around the pelvic girdle. And we get them to do these, um, you know, just uh, after a shower at night before they go to bed, but we get them working on it, you know, five to 10 minutes each day. And we think that if we give them anything longer than that, they're not going to do it. So, <laughs> so keep it really short and sweet. Um, and then the athletes will usually start to rectify that. If they don't, if we don't see any improvements, then sometimes in the cool down, um, you know, we'll pull specific athletes aside and, and work on them individually. Have you, just over your, over your years of doing this with, with young athletes, have you noticed um, a kind of um, a decrease in hip mobility maybe with, um, with kind of uh, time spent at video games and on computers and things like that. Have you seen a, you know, have you actually seen that that happening over the years? Absolutely. Um, I think I've seen a decrease in overall athleticism um, of young athletes and hip mobility is one of those things. I think, unfortunately, it's much easier to be classed as an elite youth athlete today than it was 15, 20 years ago when I was um, playing sport. And I think that's because, you know, we've, we are sitting down so much, do you know what I mean? And we are being so sedentary in our life that um, most of the, the youth athletes that we have today, everything that they do in terms of their exercise is very regimented um, and it's very disciplined and it's very focused on one specific sport. So they're not getting out and playing like we used to, do you know what I mean? Like we used to go out and play bull rush and stuck in the mud and all of these games, you know what I mean, after school that would teach that would teach normal mechanics of change of direction and keep us moving and make us work quickly. And unfortunately, I think for the youth of today, they're stuck in these regimented um, programs where the only exercise that they do is in a specific sport, you know, environment. So definitely hip mobility is one of the issues um, that I've seen. But I think it's more about the fact that the young athletes don't have a specific uh, recovery strategy in mind or maybe the importance of recovery strategies uh, are not... Uh, educated to the athletes so that they they're going out and they're playing and they're doing all of these forceful contractions you know on the muscles and tightening through the joint structures and they're, they're not spending you know not that same amount of time but a significant amount of time to then pull those muscles back to their original length so we mentioned before about and you've, you've touched on it a couple of times with regards to cool downs i mean i know there's a bit of kind of uh people maybe sit on the fence that um maybe don't uh, include that for various reasons, but what, what is your take on it and why do you kind of promote that to the kids that you work with? Yeah, I think cool down is, you know, is very, very important. Um, and as, again, as I said, the cool down can be a time where you can talk to your athletes about their performance. You can talk to their athletes about, you know, things that they need to work on to, to improve their, their personal athletic performance. And it's a time when we can, we can actually sit down and really stretch through all of the muscles that have been uh, used during the training session or during the game, um, where we can, again, as a coach, identify where those restrictions might start, you know, might be occurring in young, athlete, young athletes and pay attention to that, talk to the parents about some of the issues that are occurring and, and keep the kids, you know, actually on the field of play. So, you know, when these restrictions start occurring, we're putting the, the athletes at risk of injury. And so I think it's our responsibility as coaches to make sure that we're cooling the athletes down appropriately and using this just like the warm-up um, as another uh, period of time where we can identify any issues that are occurring in our young athletes that may lead to, to injury. Cool. So I mean, we discussed a little bit before about um, teaching athletes to, to run properly and, and maybe reduce the risk of uh, potential injuries. What, what kind of evidence have you got from your, your time um, doing what you do? that kind of demonstrates that through the through your coaching and making them actually move properly, run properly? Yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> it's funny that you asked that because just a couple of weeks ago we did a, a workshop for a whole lot of coaches at um, one of our local football academies, um, Spartans Academy, and one of the young players that one of the coaches had been working with, he'd been strapping his knee all season and his parents were saying that he 
couldn't actually play without pain in his knees. And the coach said, oh, I've just done Riddell's course. Um, and I think that that might be a problem with the pelvic girdle rather than the actual knee. Why don't you take him to the physio and get that checked out? So the physio did identify an issue. And um, two weeks later, the child was um, playing injury-free and pain-free. Um, so it's just those little differences that really make you smile. Um, I'm really thankful that you that you know that we are running these courses and doing these these um these workshops for coaches, which is fabulous. But another really big thing for us too is that um, I'm currently doing a lot of workshops for physiotherapists and podiatrists in terms of gait and running mechanics because we've got a lot of anecdotal evidence um, in terms of severs and Osgood sladders uh, that when athletes are actually taught to run correctly, um, you know, the severs or the Osgood sladders is actually, you know, reduced in terms of its, of its severity um, and sometimes it's completely diminished. Um, so, I mean, there was a really great article that came out by Dr. Andy Franklin Mira, uh, Miller, and he wrote an article which was really strange, and it was called Throw Out the Orthotics, Teach Them to Run Properly. And it was really, really nice to see that research evidence back up the, uh, the anecdotal evidence that we've got in our academy from years of working with, with young athletes. And we've got a lot of great favourable responses from the physios and the podiatrists that have come to do our workshops about how getting the athletes to do some of the drills that we implement, like a, you know, dorsi flexed, um, really strong ankling drill to teach uh, correct impulse or foot strike on the ground uh, is assisting in, in decreasing these issues that young footballers and, and other athletes, you know, suffer from. So just want to move on a little bit into a, a little debate. Well, it's not a debate at all, actually. Um, a little discussion point that I've uh, that has been brought up in a couple of other podcasts. Um, one one that was discussed at length uh, with the the um, the special edition with a couple of rugby guys that we had on um, about uh, speed ladders and why people shouldn't be using speed ladders. So you just yeah. want to just give us um, cause I think that people, especially coaches, I mean maybe youth coaches um, over here, maybe obviously not in the less so in maybe the professional game when they've got people to actually advise them, but in um, maybe like smaller academies that coaches still think that this is the way forward to actually make their kids make their kids quick so do you want to mm. keep just give us your opinion on um, on speed ladders themselves absolutely I mean most of the time people use speed ladders because they're thinking about fast feet and having fast feet actions and speed is not about having fast feet speed is about force um, do you know what I mean? And how to apply the force uh, to the ground correctly. But in terms of speed ladders in my course, I tell the coaches to burn them or throw them away or just get rid of them. Um, and reason being is that whenever you run some athletes through a speed ladder, the first thing that they do is they get up onto their toes, which we know is, you know, putting them into a slow position where they're getting braking forces up and into the pelvis. So it's doing nothing for acceleration or speed. Um, and then what happens is that they have this collapsed nature because they're looking down at their Feet. they're up onto the balls of their toes so their posture's incorrect they can't apply any force to the ground and it, I mean I guess if we wanted to give um something that coaches could use if they like the fast foot drills I would say throw the ladders away uh, where the athletes are looking down because they're scared of tripping through the ladders uh you know and they're up on their toes and maybe create a bigger ladder through tape on the ground or with some, you know, dust powder on the ground where you can create a bigger ladder where you can do some nice, um, you know, inside edge, outside edge kind of uh, change of direction, lateral movements uh, on the ladder, but with a, with a flat foot, do you know what I mean? And with the head up looking forward because now they're not afraid of actually tripping over the ladder. I think most of the time the athletes are looking down at their feet because they don't want to trip through the ladder and the ladders are usually quite small. So throw them away put some tape on the ground, do the drills if you love the fast feet drills on the ground, but keep the athletes with their, their head up because they want to see the game that's going on around them. Um, talk about inside edge, outside edge, talk about flat feet, talk about force um, and get the athletes doing the drills correctly. But yeah, throw them away. <laughs> so so no, play, no place at all? No place at all in my Excellent. academy. <laughs> <laughs> So are you, are you still seeing when, when you go around these different clubs, obviously people getting you to, to come in and do your thing with them, are, are they shocked when they when you present that, that kind of uh, rationale to them why they should be binned? 
Sometimes they are at the, at the beginning, but when I explain why um, and the reasons behind it and how we really want to work on explosive speed mechanics for our athletes and not just have them on their toes prancing around a little, you know, ladder, um, they're usually, you know, we usually get them on board. Because yeah. I'm, I'm sure you're aware, it, there's, it's, it's made worse when you see things on the internet of, and uh, one thing that comes to mind was in the uh, NBA finals, when there was, I don't know who it was, um, basketball knowledge isn't the best, but you get yes. people kind of, like you say, prancing through, and people see that and think that's the that's the way forward. Yeah, I think sometimes it's a difference between doing something that people have always done, um, and then, I mean, just because we've always done something doesn't mean that it's right, um, and then really understanding the, um, you know, the, the mechanics, the biomechanics, and, you know, the force into the ground, and understanding why it is that we do the drills that we do, having a reason for everything that we do as coaches, and making sure that our athletes understand that reason, um, and, you know, I'd really love to hear the justification for using those, la those ladders in that environment, you know, from those coach, and, and see what their reason was. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I won't keep you. I won't keep you much longer. But when you when you're going to come over to the UK and you're you know, going around various different places, what is the what is the theme of why they want you to be there? Because I'm, I'm sure they've already got someone that they employ. Um, so so what what kind of more are they um, are they wanting from you guys? Yeah, I think one of the things is is that most um, academies most definitely have, you know, strength and conditioning coaches or fitness coaches or whatever title they give to, to those people. But it's really, really difficult for people in those positions to be across everything and be a specialist in all areas. Um, because I'm a, a sports speed specialist um, and I research it and, you know, read constantly and, and I'm researching this, as I said, you know, in my thesis for my master's, um, I really think that I can give them, you know, some really take home usable tips that they can use straight away with their players um, and help them to identify, you know, maybe restrictions or issues in their players that they don't realise impacts their explosive speed or their speed reserve or, you know, their, you know, their energy and fuel tank on, on the field. Um, I'm a really strong believer that if you get running right, um, then all of the, the skills of the athlete will improve, their total athletic performance will improve because if you teach athletes how to run correctly and you teach them how to accelerate with explosive force, then not only are they going to get to the ball first, they're going to beat their opponent, um, you know, they're going to get, you know, steal bases in baseball or whatever it may be. Um, but then, But what it also does is it allows them to have a higher level of percentage of fuel for their skills. Um, and sometimes what I find is that athletes are using too much fuel just to position themselves around the paddock and around the field um, and utilising, you know, crucial fuel that's needed in the last 10, 15 minutes of the game um, to delay that onset of fatigue, to keep them, you know, uh, safe from injury, but also to still be performing at their best, uh, you know, in those last minutes of the game. And that's very, very rare. And I think a lot of that comes from, you know, forced leakages and, and fuel leakages from inefficient running. Mm -hmm. Sounds great. So where can people um, where can people book onto the course? Uh, for our UK course details, uh, they can just email me if they like at renell at academyofsportspeed.com. Um, we only have 25 seats uh, per course and there's only two courses running in the UK. Um, so hopefully, um, yeah, so if people are interested, they can either contact me by email personally or they can just go to our website, which is academyofsportspeed.com. Cool. I'll um, I'll stick a link to the um, to the site and to your email address on on, on paceperformance.co.uk so people can easily get access on there. So so where else can people keep in touch with what you got going on? Uh, Twitter, Facebook, anything like that? Instagram. Oh, Rob, I just lost you. Sorry, mate. Uh, sorry. Um, so where can people um, where can people keep in touch with you? So Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Absolutely. All, um, all except for Instagram. We're not on Instagram okay. yet. We're definitely Twitter and Facebook. Um, if, if they go to our website, um, academyofsportspeed.com, then it's got all of the links to, to Twitter and Facebook as well. Superb. And I'll put the links up on the site as well so people can uh, can get in touch with you on there. So that cool. Well, thank you very much for your time. Really appreciate it. Thank you. It was a pleasure talking to you. Cool. And I will um, we'll hopefully get together when you come over in October. Absolutely. That would be great. And hopefully hopefully see two, um, two full courses in Manchester. Yes.
Absolutely, that's the goal. Cool. Well, I will. Um, I'll speak to you shortly, and thank you very much again. Thanks, Rob. Take care. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Thanks for tuning in to episode 43 of the Pacey Performance Podcast. I hope you enjoyed the chat with Ronell. Got some great guests coming up over the next couple of weeks and months, so please keep checking back to paceyperformance.co.uk and follow me on Twitter at Pacey Perform. Like I said before, if you are enjoying the content of the podcast, please leave an honest rating and review on iTunes, uh, and I'd really appreciate that. And I will speak to you in episode 44.